partnerships. And I think these are some of the issues that have come, have come out clearly from the previous speakers. Um, how this uh, affects how mobile applications that are built for citizen engagement are used is, uh, we found over 20 water applications that had been built, but were discarded because they were not able to scale, and so citizens were not using them. So if you want to close the loop to show how uh, you can use mobile technology to uh, promote citizen engagement, and thus ensure that the feedback loop is closed, uh, you have to tackle all these issues. So I'm going to give an example of one of the applications we found that uh, has managed to uh, kind of create a framework that we can use for reference. It is called Maji Voice. Maji is Swahili for water. So if you go to majivoice.com, you can read more about it. But how this application works is from the iHub, we held a hackathon, which is a programming marathon for 48 hours. And uh, the water stakeholders came together and gave us a bunch of issues to build applications for. The second thing that was done was the winners of the hackathon were then uh, given a reward by the World Bank, which is the funding partner, to develop the system. And then there was the water utility, which is the third party vendor that was going to implement the developed solution in their services. And the fourth thing is one of the other partners was government through an organization called WASREP, which is the regulator who uh, regulates the water service providers to make sure that they provide a good service to the citizen. So here you close the feedback loop. You have this application that has been developed by a technology community, and then you have this water vendor who is providing water services to the citizens. And in the application, if a citizen sends a message through uh, the platform, uh, if the vendor does not act with regards to the service uh, level agreement, then the message is escalated to the regulator who follows up. And with regards to funding, we had an external international organization that took care of the development costs of the application. So this is just a, a model of how to use technology, in particular mobile, to close the feedback loop that is faced when you come to issues of uh, promoting uh, digital governance and using technology such as mobile. Maybe just to add why mobile is quite popular, um, in Kenya, People, more people have mobiles than have access to resources like internet or electricity. So in this case, uh, looking at how mobile could be used was a better case uh, because uh, at the moment, over 75% of a population of 41 million has access to a mobile device, but very few people have access to other resources like internet and electricity. So in this case, leveraging the mobile device uh, was a better choice for it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Indeed, an interesting and fascinating example. Um, you have heard now all the other case studies in this brief description. Is uh, there anything you found interesting or something we, would you like to learn more about uh, to uh, improve your system? Or do you have a question to one of the uh, others to explain more? Yes, uh, the first presentation by Daniel. <coughs> My country just uh, enacted in April a cybersecurity law, and uh, one of the issues that is emerging is uh, all these applications that are being developed uh, to promote communication online. Uh, there is a big loophole with regards to the information that is stored in those applications, and it affects largely cybersecurity as well. So maybe. Uh, would you comment on that and tell us uh, maybe key aspects to consider even as we continue promoting openness of, info of platforms used to encourage dialogue online? Um, I would like to take your question to a more broad, actually the broadest scope of, uh, um, of, uh, of analysis, if I may, and actually make a comment about cybersecurity but also about internet governance given at least three case studies in addition to the one I made by Ryan, Laila, and, uh, and uh, Marile, if I may, and the, the point, I think, rises from the case of cybersecurity, but then it is also relevant to the other three case studies, at least the three case studies I have heard, is, it's, is that instead of focusing on the two broad models of state control, namely the tight Gulliver model, so to speak, thinking of the net mundial's presumable uh, developing countries oriented distributive justice related emerging economies approach and, on the, and, and to some degree also the ComCom case. And on the other hand, if you think about the Aurelia, Aurelia, or, Aurelian model, of course, giving the example of Lila in Turkey to some degree, but much more Russia and Iran today, 
Uh, it seems that from everything we have said, something in between is happening that is even more relevant than the two extremes, namely the Aurelian model and the tight Gulliver model. And it's also true for cybersecurity to a large extent. And that is uh, the rise of uh, kind of a plasmatic type of a nation that is uh, uh, obviously a, a archetypical government that make part of uh, internet, internet governance apparatus at large that is benevolent, it is social, social, socio-technologically benevolent and goes in between. It shows two, 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 two types of, of patterns. On the one hand, these are governments in many countries, right, uh, that seem to be uh, much more co in competitively uh, advantageous over the physical and the logical layers. They have better gateways, transit backbone services, ISPs, IP name and address systems, uh, privacy and node systems, and they do that better and better as time goes by. And similarly, on the content layer, we see governments uh, f competing over content quite effectively. And yet, on the other hand, on what you would call the identity layer, to paraphrase of Osli Benkler, what you see is that instead of people, the people, right, rising against governments in this in-between intermediate benevolent social technological model, the people at large are not rising against the, their governments. In kind of in a broad uh, plasmatic perspective, as I suggested, what you see instead is that the, the ethnocentristic approach by most people in most countries, at least in the uh, liberal democratic countries, uh, people log in, purchase, consume, educate, uh, surf, entertain, ethnocentristically, nationally, and as opposed to internationally, globally, that doesn't really happen as much. And if that is a uh, uh, the case comes the question, so what do we do? If indeed it's not an Aurelian set of countries that we need to combat, and on the other hand, it's not a tight Gulliver reality we'll really end up getting because net mundial is a vision as opposed to a plan, if I might add my humble opinion here, of a fine vision by all means, but still a vision as opposed to a real plan, uh, modus operandi of how to get there. Uh, what we need to find is something along the life of an in-between type of it in a governance set of challenges. Instead of focusing, focusing on the old school type of concerns, internet governance was focused, about, uh, uh, focused on gateway scarcity, root splitting, uh, Orwellianism at large, right? We should start thinking of the in-between benevolent type of reality of so many governments uh, worldwide, including mine, in the case that I suggested, the uh, over-regulation of software, of soft law, of course, and standard setting became an issue in a few of the examples you have heard, including my own, uh, we should be more concerned of the way the democratic deficit standard setting organizations are creating in this type of in-between model. Cooperating between industries and governments is all very nice, and yet, is it really cooperation that is taking place or overrunning of the show by SSOs instead? And with a democratic deficit, of a, with a lack of check and balances, challenge number one, challenge number two, uh, cultural absolutism, you see cultural absolutism and at least cultural relativism in so many examples such as, again, my own, if you make the difference between cyber crime on the one hand and national security motivations on the other in comparison to other countries, and uh, majoritarianism and even syndicalism giving the voluntary stakeholders uh, apparatus giving that it assumes uh, a group of people in that's type of consensual approach could actually lead to a consensual overtake uh, of mm. the show. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm afraid that we are already running out of the extra time the uh, organizers kindly offered us for this panel. Uh, it would be fascinating to see more connections, but I think we have uh, seen some already. Um, I do not wrap up the thing here right now, but I will give you with my uh, final words here um, the context and the next steps. Uh, what you have uh, seen here is a presentation and discussion of a set of um, a case studies, the first set of case studies uh, we are um, analyzing as a network of internet research centers. It's part of a bigger endeavor. There will be more case studies. There will be a synthesis based on discussions like the discussion we had here about um, what are the specifics of the case, what are things that uh, are pr uh, problems or issues at least in uh, different uh, case studies like the link to the uh, regulation in place. We talked about that or the rules uh, on which you operate in this kind of enquete commission thing. 
Um, so it's just a starting point we can see here. It uh, will go on and hopefully with your input and your ideas. Uh, thanks very much. We um, now leave the stage and uh, the next session will, I think, immediately without a break uh, happen here. I thank very much uh, the discussion here. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to Nexa for inviting us and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. <laughs> there, there used to be a feature all the time huh? in the New Yorker magazine for bad metaphors called Block That Metaphor. Oh. Okay, just testing whether this microphone is working, and I guess it is. Uh, welcome to the session. Um, I'm very happy to have with me here all four panelists that will be speaking. Um, this session is around building blocks and toolkits for distributed internet governance models. And here we will take a more practical uh, look at some tools, best practices, and platforms that are aimed at supporting the formation, performance and, uh, of distributed col and collaborative internet governance models, groups and mechanisms. Um, with me, I'm Maite Schomburg. I am based with the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin and have been the coordinator of the network of centers for the past two years. And I'm very grateful to our hosts here at the Nexa Center for organizing, hosting this event. Um, with me, at the far end, I have Bill Drake, who is International Fellow and Lecturer in the Media Change and Innovation Division at the Institute of Mass Communication and Media Research at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He's also the Chair um, of the Non-Commercial Users Constituency in ICANN and uh, a member of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group of the UN's Internet Governance Forum. Lastly, he's a member of the multi-stakeholder OneNet Coalition's Coordinating Committee and probably uh, is active in many other formats as well, which uh, I cannot all mention here for the lack of time. He will be talking about IGF best practice models. Next to my right, I have Jovan Kub Kubalia. How do you? Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, who is the founding director of the Diplo Foundation based in Geneva, also in Switzerland. He's a former diplomat with a professional and academic background in international law, diplomacy, and information diplomacy. He will be talking about the Geneva Internet Platform. Here I have Stefan Verholst, who is the co-founder and chief research development officer of the Governance Lab at the New York University, where he's also responsible for building a research foundation 
on how to transform governance using advances in science and technology. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Culture and Communications at New York University. Um, and finally, I have Constance uh, Baumelaire, who is a remote participant. You can see her here. Um, thank you very much for going through the trouble of setting uh, this, participation, uh, this uh, remote participation tool up. I know it wasn't very easy. Um, she's the Senior Director of Global Policy Partnerships at the Internet Society, um, also called ISOC, and helps developing partnerships with international organizations, as well as strategic positions on key Internet issues. She founded and now coordinates the Internet Technical Advisory Committee at the OECD, and also leads ISOC's engagement with UNESCO, WIPO, the G8, the G20, and the IGF. Now, um, I'm very determined. <laughs> I may be German, but I was uh, uh, educated in Switzerland, so we're um, big on timing. Very determined to leave some uh, space for a discussion with you, the audience. So please do ignore the distance between this podium and yourselves and just pretend you're sitting here with us and really do take the opportunity to, after these presentations, join in, in the discussion. And now, without further ado, I uh, pass on to Bill Drake. Thank you, Marta, and hello again. Um, so the last panel established the precedent that we could sit with the laptops that are in our laps, so that's good. So this time I can follow along what I, I've been thinking of saying. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, an argument that I've advanced with a, a colleague uh, in a recent uh, book that was prepared before the IGF about institutionalizing uh, the clearinghouse function um, in internet governance. And I will uh, say a bit about what, that, what I mean by that. And so I'm gonna basically uh, talk off of that and it links very closely with what Stefan will be talking about later. And, uh, and he's gonna give a, a specific example of an uh, um, initiative that he's doing now that sort of uh, is along the same lines. Um, if you start from the basic premise of looking at the ecosystem as an ecosystem and asking uh, how well is not, does knowledge uh, and information relevant to internet governance get aggregated, uh, compiled, circulated, made available, digested, etc., cetera, um, for stakeholders, governments, etc. cetera, uh, I think one could argue that um, we, we face a, a, an unusual problem. There's both information overload and at the same time an undersupply of usable information. Uh, we find all the time that there's massive amounts of knowledge and information being generated about internet governance, but yet we find very often that people find it difficult to process all of that, to find their way through the thicket of what's available in order to formulate um, solutions. And this is a challenge, I think, particularly for newcomers and for developing country governments. Uh, uh, who often express the concern that um, in trying to figure out how to tackle uh, certain kinds of problems, whether it's spam or network security or so on, um, where there is not some established global mechanism to serve as a, a, a guidance or a negotiation framework, um, it's difficult for them to sort of sort through all the, the information and get effective access to it in a way that they can use. And this has, I think, helped to, to um, stimulate the demand on the part of some developing country governments uh, over the past decade for a greater intergovernmental role in internet governance. The idea that we needed some sort of a new centralized one-stop uh, shop that could provide access to information and be the place where you could tackle all the different problems that come up uh, is, uh, has been very much a live concern for many uh, governments, and you know, you can understand their perspective in some ways, because it is uh, very, very difficult. We've talked in the first panel about the distributed nature of the institutional environment and how there's so many different, uh, different forums and processes and so on. It's hard for anybody to really track all of that, make sense of it, and particularly to respond effectively to some of the challenges that where there isn't a well-structured mechanism in place uh, is an issue. And so this has been discussed a lot uh, in various contexts through the from the World Summit on the Information Society process in 2002 to 2005, through the Internet Governance Forums development and so on. Uh, and the whole debate that we've had uh, at the global level about enhanced cooperation 
and they established, there was a working group on enhanced cooperation that tried to map so, some of these issues and, and say, uh, how can we address the so-called orphaned issues, the issues that don't fall clearly within the jurisdiction of one international organization, but yet which are pressing and with, to which governments want to respond. And that effort ultimately did not um, yield the best fruit, but it's, there's still some ongoing work related to that. So, th this has been a point that some of us in civil society have been pressing for quite some time. If you go back a decade to some of the early thinking around the, the Internet Governance Forum, there were proposals from many of us in civil society that the IGF could play this kind of uh, clear knowledge and information clearinghouse function, that it would uh, be a place where you could do ongoing uh, monitoring of developments, gathering of information, aggregation of information into usable formats, and then uh, provisioning uh, uh, dissemination to developing country governments and other actors. Um, and one could additionally uh, do other things like, on top of simply making information available, providing analysis or providing fac facilitation in the development of what we've called distributed governance groups. That's to say, forming policy networks that can help you solve a problem. Um, and that idea has come up again in recent years. It's been endorsed in the Net Mondial uh, statement, and it was in the, the Ilvis report, which we referred to earlier. Um, so the question then becomes, is there something here that we could do that would be really useful to help reduce the friction and the transaction costs and the information costs of trying to access and make usable information so that actors are more effectively able to participate in global governance decision making? I can imagine three possible uh, ways in which this could be especially useful. Uh, one is, as I said, uh, this notion of orphaned issues, which has been much debated. Uh, the, you know, many times the governments say, well, for example, security is an orphan issue because there's no UN agency that has comprehensive responsibility for network security issues. So where do we go when we have a problem with security issues, etc.? The reality is that there's a vast amount of work being done on security, but it's all dis distributed across a variety of different institutional environments. And it's hard for actors to grab all that, pull all that together and figure out, okay, Based on what's out there, here's how I could forge a, a new approach at the national level, et cetera. So dealing with orphaned issues or perceived orphaned issues would be one thing that such an information supply mechanism could do. Another thing would be to provide broad and balanced access to information because sometimes governments and other actors get access to information about some governance challenge that reflects one view and not the range of views that are out there. I think in particular of the World Conference on International Telecommunications that went on in 2012. We had this huge global debate. You'll recall that the, the effort to revise the international telecommunications regulations ended up with a very divisive uh, process where 55 governments refused to sign the treaty and 89 did. Um, and part of what was going on there was that the different sides were hearing one kind of take, one kind of view about what the issues were, what the challenges were. So making sure that people have access to balanced information about all issues from multiple perspectives, I think, could be useful. And thirdly, creating a mechanism to help provide um, a, a broad cross-cutting kind of assessment of how internet governance is being done in different environments and assessing the extent to which those different environments meet standards of good practice, that's to say, how transparent are they, how accountable are they, how inclusive are they in their decision making, et cetera, in order to encourage uh, institutional environments to move up their game in terms of meeting those standards by sharing information in an organized way. These are things I think that one could possibly imagine doing. And the question then becomes, how could you do it? Well, these are all uh, issues, these are complex issues, obviously, and the kinds of functions that we're talking about, organizing information, aggregating it, putting it together into formats that can be used, uh, providing analysis, uh, providing relationship management, these are things that could be viewed in a modular way and could be handled in a number of different bodies, but then you have sometimes inadequate co coordination um, and you don't kind of get as much out of it as you might be able to, or they could be done in a sort of more integrated way, in a single kind of uh, mechanism focused on a particular issue set or geographical region, et cetera. 
And so what we've advanced is an argument about how one might start to think about formulating such a thing. What the elements of it would be in terms of um, the, the, you know, how you design it, uh, what would be the different aspects that have to be built into it, most particularly making sure that there's a real user engagement in the design of, of such things, because there's not much point in the global community coming and saying, you know, hello, we're, we're here from Geneva and we're ready to help, you know, and in formulating some big complex new mechanism that the actors don't want to use. You have to make sure that this is effectively co-designed with the, par the, the potential users. But there's a number of different elements that could be taken on board in thinking about how to do this. And then the second set of questions, and then I'll conclude, is uh, where or how would you institutionalize this function of providing more effective information access and so on. And there's a lot of different possibilities here, ranging from simply strengthening the status quo and helping those organizations that are already involved in the knowledge provisioning business to do so in a more effective and coordinated way, to creating some new kind of mechanism, whether within an existing intergovernmental organization, although I think that'd be problematic, or a new multi-stakeholder body or something. Um, there are a lot of different ways that one can tackle these problems. So the, to conclude, the challenge then is to say, is there a need to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of information and knowledge uh, provisioning and management at the global level? And if so, how can we effectively intervene and try to make a difference uh, in that problem? And Stefan has uh, been working on one possible element of that solution. So I, I turn to him and others uh, on the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was nine minutes and 59 seconds, which is pretty impressive. Um, Constance, I would now turn to you. Um, you have been uh, heavily involved with um, coordinating um, the best practice sessions that uh, were first tried within the Internet Governance Forum this year. So perhaps you can share with us some of your experiences and takeaways from that. Absolutely. C can you hear me well? Can everyone hear her well? Yes, the audience is nodding. Okay, Th thank you very much and thank you for accommodating um, remote participation to, to your discussions today. Um, I was listening with great attention to what uh, Bill uh, Drake uh, w was saying and, and I, I think I agree with his assessment. Uh, there really is a need to uh, strengthen uh, existing bodies, existing fora who have this capacity of uh, coordinating information, coordinating efforts, uh, and making sure that uh, the quality and availability of information is possible for all uh, interested stakeholders. Um, I realize that you may have difficulties to see my face. Maybe we have a light problem here. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I, I, hope the, I hope the sound is good at least. Um, so, building on this um, acknowledgement that uh, the community is in search of a forum, of a place where literally it can take its burning, emerging internet-related issues, work together uh, on shared outcomes, and um, especially share the expertise from the different stakeholder groups. I mean, you need to have at the table technical experts, but you also obviously need to bring in uh, policy makers and the voice of civil society and, and business as well. Um, we envisioned uh, that the IGF could literally step up um, within the uh, boundaries of its existing mandate. There is room for growth, um, and we see the potential that this forum offers. First of all, it's under the UN banner, which offers a certain level of comfort to governments. At the same time, it is fully multi-stakeholder within its DNA. Um, you mentioned that some of us are on the MAG, the multi-stakeholder advisory group. Um, this group uh, comprises individuals from not only civil society, governments, business, uh, the technical community, and has the power each year to work on the construction of the agenda of the IGF while the IGF is under the UN banner. This is a very, very unique model. 
And this hybrid model offers also a lot of flexibility. This is why we, we've been um, putting some seeds in the ground this year with um, other colleagues from the MAG and other colleagues from the IGF community trying to start these best practices uh, forums. It's been said um, by many uh, qualified people that the IGF is useful, but it is only a talk shop. It is only a place where people discuss and actually have nothing to bring back home. Um, with the launch of the best practices, but also with other initiatives that, that take place that are being developed at the IGF today, with the development of messages of, of principles, we've, we've seen other tangible outcomes um, for IGF 2014 that was recently held in Istanbul. With specifically the best practices forums, what we're aiming to do is to tackle difficult issues. So this year we started with five themes, online child protection, uh, mitigating spam, uh, developing meaningful multi-stakeholder mechanisms, uh, how to establish certs for uh, security, for cybersecurity, and how to uh, develop enabling environments for uh, local content. Five themes um, gathering uh, about 50 to 110 experts uh, through virtual communities that were managed by the IHF Secretariat with the help of external consultants. And uh, these groups over the weeks preceding the IGF have done uh, a very methodological work. They started to try to define the issues and then to look at the regional specificities and then following a list of common questions, um, trying to agree on what seems to be common ground in terms of best practices, whether these best practices are, are public policy frameworks, whether they come from the industry, whether they're voluntary uh, best practices, trying to identify common ground for these best practices, uh, acknowledging when you actually have uh, different views in terms of what constitutes a best practice, and then also trying to um, lay the foundations of future work for collaboration for these different expert communities um, between IGF 2014 and IGF 2015. Um, so I said this process is quite new. Uh, we literally had uh, seven weeks uh, to launch it ahead of the, the IGF um, 2014. Uh, so obviously we still have a lot of work to do. We need to work with the Secretariat to engage better the community, to make sure that um, all stakeholders are aware of the process. I had people coming to me at the IGF in Istanbul, a lot of people from the academic community saying, we were not aware of this process. How can we get in? How can we comment on the draft outcomes? Um, so that's something um, that really needs to be taken into account as we think of the next steps to strengthen um, this process and make sure it stays relevant, visible, uh, transparent and um, and useful for the for the community. The the other very new element I would like to emphasize um, that is brought with the development of best practices, but also with the work of dynamic coalitions, the work of those through workshops or main sessions at the IGF uh, who try to. Um, uh, uh, agree on uh, some sort of outcome for the IGF. Um, what is very new is that they are getting organized to work intersessionally. Um, one of the difficulties with the IGF, with the past, the previous IGFs, I would say, is that basically you would have one IGF, a few regional national IGFs, more or less uh, linked to the global IGF, and then um, basically a few MAG meetings, open consultations, uh, but a vacuum. Uh, whereas communities, whenever new, e new issues emerge, need to be able, um, between 
national, uh, between the, the, the global IGFs, the annual editions, need to be able to take their issues whenever they emerge, whenever they, they pop up, uh, to a forum, to a community, to be able to start immediately um, working uh, on those issues. So this, this is um, also the intention, is really to have um, the IGF secretariat and community, if possible, evolve towards a new working methodology where literally we could have these communities alive throughout the year and ready to uh, tackle, address, work on any of those um, new issues whenever they, they pop up. Um, in conclusion, I would um, also like to say that the process is important. Best practices are a process. There are other processes within the IGF or outside the IGF uh, to work collaboratively um, and try to reach consensus and try to make progress and have tangible common outcomes on issues. Uh, but I would also um, emphasize that um, the, the substantive agenda of uh, the IGF and other fora, of course, needs to be more and more focused. Um, I think we're here to share uh, ideas on what works, what doesn't work uh, in very practical uh, terms. And I'm, I'm sharing a bit of the experience we had with the best practices at the IGF, acknowledging that we're still really at the beginning. Uh, but overall, thinking of this forum, we need the community interested in this forum really needs to make sure that the discussions are more and more focused, more and more relevant um, and we're really hoping because we do feel that there is um, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm uh, to get this forum at the place where it can be uh, strong, relevant, inclusive, uh, pertinent, uh, able to react, pick up, address emerging issues, and basically um, uh, provide this service that uh, Bill was mentioning that is needed um, offering a platform where people can uh, effectively work together. Um, we are hoping that between now and IGF 2015, we will be able with other colleagues from the IGF community to take the IGF, to take this forum where we would like to see it in uh, about a year now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, Javan, uh, you will be giving us a presentation. Um, Jovan will be telling us something about the Geneva Internet Platform, um, which basically, um, while well, you get set up, um, which basically is also uh, in charge of capacity building with a very certain uh, specific um, stakeholder group, namely diplomats. So please go ahead. I think this is a staff presentation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Let's switch up. Yeah, I, I would love to hear you. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Ivan. And uh, let me use this opportunity to thank you for hosting this event, great event. Uh, I'm. Um, I'll show you a few slides and images. I think the session before the lunch is always difficult to, un to keep the attention of the, the audience. Well, as might indicated, I'm coming from a Geneva Internet Platform. I'm director of the Diplo Foundation, and we host Geneva Internet Platform. And the next eight minutes, might or 10? Yes, uh, I will uh, give you the presentation of summary of activities of Geneva Internet Platform through three main functions. Uh, Geneva Internet Platform was established in April this year after almost three years of discussions and uh, consultations with Swiss government and the players in Geneva. There was quite in-depth analysis what is needed in the internet governance field. And three needs were identified. First one, to have more evidence-based internet governance, and you will see on a few examples. Second, to overcome policy silos. And third, to engage, particularly in Geneva, actors who do not have a capacity to follow 
internet governance completely. Those are three main functions of Geneva Internet Platform. As you can see, it's established with the support of the Swiss government. Here are the few institutions that have been involved in our activities over the last uh, eight months. We are extending the number of associated partners and you're invited to join us. Uh, first, let me just check how many of you, could you raise your hands, attended the Internet Governance Forum? Well, quite, quite a few. Then you're familiar with one unique uh, practice in Internet Governance Forum, ICANN and ITU. As a matter of fact, it was initiated by ICANN. Those are so-called transcribes or verbatim reports from the event. Therefore, whatever is said in the preparatory process at the IGF meeting itself is transcribed into the text. And for those of you who are involved in the research on internet governance, it's a literally gold mine for academic research. We at Diplo and Geneva Internet Platform, our cognitive research team, establish this element of uh, internet governance observatory. And I, will, I took a few examples related to our meeting today. Few titles, one is eco, eco, ecosystem eco or ecosystem, as somebody said and positioning of the ecosystem into the overall text corpus of Internet Governance Forum in Istanbul. Therefore, we are speaking about five days, more than 100 workshops. Therefore, you can notice that the uh, uh, ecosystem is the closest to Net Mundial. Therefore, this is emergence and paternity that started, uh, started appearing, and it is the obvious reason Net Mundial was a, let's say, big launch of the concept of e uh, ecosystem. Now, what we are trying to do at the platform, we are trying to follow emergence of the new concepts. For example, distributed uh, uh, hasn't been used a lot in Istanbul. Probably we can expect, after your activities, to have it more prominent at the next IGF in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, as you can see here, based on this cognitive analysis and phylogenetic tree, this is a uh, basically done by our uh, cognitive experts and linguistical experts. You have proximity of net mundial, digital, human rights, ecosystem, and uh, cyber. It is, in, in a way, uh, we can call it X-ray of Internet Governance Forum. And it was our response to the mainly uh, descriptive analysis and academic work on Internet Governance Forum and the architecture and Internet governance in general. We wanted to see what is in reality, what, what was said during the IGF, what are the concepts. We also noticed that ecosystem and net mundial has been mentioned in emotionally very positive context, unlike some other, some other concepts. Not that much in a cyber security and cyber crime context. There were many, many insights that you can get from this X-ray analysis of the text corpus of Internet uh, Governance Forum. By the way, we have also trans uh, transcriptions from the ICANN meeting. ITU started introducing it, and it is, in a way, positive gem session, if I can use jazz terminology. IGF borrowed it from ICANN, then ITU from IGF, and generally speaking, Internet Governance field is ahead of other policy fields when it comes to, the, to uh, this aspect of the Internet Governance. This is very, don't worry, I won't go into explaining what is in the Hills plot, but uh, my cognitive colleagues told me that this is the sort of ultimate holy grail of cognitive analysis and linguistical analysis. And uh, I asked them to explain to what is in it, and they sent me a papers on, paper on 10 pages. Therefore, that's, that's a bit risky terrain. Now, we also analyzed uh, throughout the IGF, since the first IGF, use of prefixes. Because prefixes are usually uh, framing the discussion. Cyber is used mainly for security, e for e-commerce, online human rights, digital uh, is becoming now fashionable, but it was introduced in development context, virtual, net resurface with net mundial. And what we saw at the net mundial, obviously, it is a huge, huge rise in the use of the net and the, as, a, as a prefix. Net neutrality, netizen, and other terms. And almost disappearance of prefix e, which was the key prefix during the World Summit on Information Society, e-education, e-health, e-commerce. One of the explanations is that the European Commission decided to distance itself from the, so from the failed Lisbon, Lisbon digital agenda, which used heavily e 
as, uh, as a prefix. Therefore, if you carefully analyze EU documents, they're now digital. There is digital agenda, digital development, and, uh, and, uh, and other issues. What we also found in the analysis, which was very interesting uh, from the net, uh, last IGF, that, for example, if you see the third line where the governments are, governments had relatively high presentation, but they were relatively silent during the IGF. They didn't make that many statements. And on the other side, you have NGO with a bit lower uh, representation, but more talkative and more loud during the, during the IGF. Some explanation that governments were silent is this delicate and tricky phase. They were more, uh, more vocal during the previous IGFs. Now they decided to move to more wait and see uh, approach. Therefore, this is the first function of, I just uh, brought one segment, small segment of this observatory function, which was done on text mining. We will be publishing results, including the mapping of the internet governance field through the IGF text corpus. The second uh, function is uh, fostering uh, digital governance. And uh, here we speak about trying to address IG issues in a cross-silos uh, way. Here is the one explanation with the subway map of the internet governance space or a building under construction, which we drew 10 years ago and we are now building a new one, which, will be, which is more fancy. It will have two elevators, but you will, you will hear, uh, and it will have two additional floors, human rights and cyber security, security floor. And some people have suggested that 10 years ago we uh, drew ICANN as a hippie person trying to protect the basic infrastructure. You can see him in the, in the basement. And uh, we, were, we were sort of advised that we have to change the sort of uh, fashion style and clothing of our ICANN representative at uh, drawing. Now, the last point is Geneva. I'm bringing the discussion back home, 51 issues. We did analysis, quantitative analysis, of the coverage of the internet governance issues in Geneva. We came uh, by using, this is the cylinder explaining different uh, issues, and this is the extract from the methodology that we use for the coverage, uh, level of representation, decision-making, legal instruments, that approximately 52% of internet governance issues are covered in Geneva. Now, we can engage in interesting discussion, what is the relevance, what is the weight of different, different, different issues. And extract from methodology is available here, and I can send you via email in the follow-up. Now, what we noticed in Geneva, and th that's nothing new, you are aware of on the national and regional level, that issues are covered in silos. You had Human Rights Council discussion, discussing human rights aspect of the privacy and data protection, WTO commercial, w uh, ITU, ISO, and you name it and you have it. Therefore, the first, second function of the platform is to bring dif these different communities together. And I can tell you it's not an easy task. You're speaking about the different ways of framing the problems, language. People tend to communicate in their small circles, and this is uphill battle, but we are making some, some progress in it. Next year, we will focus on the interplay between cybersecurity, human rights, and business environment for, uh, for uh, uh, internet governance, which is also a triangle which will inspire the Hague conference in the spring 2015, hosted by Dutch, Dutch government. Okay, the last function, therefore, first, evidence-based the, the decision-making, second one, overcoming policy silos, and third one is engaging digital actors. This was basically the main motivation when we started the Geneva Internet Platform, is to help small missions, missions of small and developing countries to cover internet governance issues. And here we come from the big, big designs, big uh, meta-narratives to very concrete issues of having a mission with uh, two or three diplomats, starting in the morning with humanitarian issues, moving to the human rights, uh, having in the meantime health issues and ending the day with Digital, digital agenda. Here is the guy which we try to explain the diplomat from the typical small mission in Geneva. And uh, what we noticed is that they have the, there is over um, uh, supply of training in Geneva. Now, what we did, we identified and integrated training into the policy processes. Therefore, in April, between 6th of March and 8th of April, they were trained in internet governance by following preparations for Net Mundial and other IG processes. Therefore, when they come to the course, 
what they learn, they immediately can use in the policy process. This is a small innovation which has been working quite, quite well. For 2015, we are preparing a course on online privacy and cybersecurity and the human rights. Uh, out of side Geneva, we are trying to use the concept of remote hubs, engaging global community, and uh, unblocking this little bandwidth between Geneva and the rest of the world, which is usually uh, based on the missions, small missions. Therefore, we are trying to engage communities from all over the world by using the inspiration of the, of the following the World Cup. Uh, it's a Germany, yes, yes, a Germany won it. If I, if I uh, may just not interrupt, yes, but I and just, I'm, I just, to ask just a few more, few more points. Uh, here is the, how the observatory functions. And what is the key, what we notice, this is the last point, is that uh, you need to provide the context. Context is the key. And the context for policy maker, making is essential. There are no shortcuts. You can use e-tools, but sometimes you need to knock on the doors. You can to, to spend hours explaining. And I'm afraid that technology cannot help us a lot when it comes to perception and the policy aspect of the process. Uh, last one, we are uh, starting discussion on the philosophical, ethical, legal concepts of, on the, and some sort of drafting of new internet social contract. The next stop on our journey is Geneva Internet Conference, 18th and 19th of November. Please join us and join us for other activities. You can find more information on the, on the website. Thank you. Thank you Did very I... much. Thank you. Yeah. I will need some help here. Um, thank you very much, and um, 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 it's always good to follow uh, uh, Joban, um, especially with regard to the uh, level of cartoons that uh, uh, he brings to the table. I, I definitely will uh, fail in uh, uh, achieving that level of sophistication. Uh, but it was also very good to know that Geneva, um, pushing the uh, aquarium metaphor, is basically one is actually where you would go to see the, the aquarium in action. Uh, as far as I understand from uh, 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 Jova. Now, um, uh, Urs started this morning by um, um, posing a question, uh, which is an important question given the audience that we have here, which is what can academics do uh, in the field of internet governance? And what I'm going to try to um, um, advocate for is that academics can actually help uh, create insight and meaning in the distributed nature of the internet governance space that we have now. And we desperately need help in order to map the current stage in order to then ultimately extract meaning, provide context, uh, um, enable analysis, and so on, and so on. And ultimately also to allow for a distributed environment not to become chaos. Because I think that's, from my point of view, the lesson learned from the discussion about distributed internet governance is that, as um, Bill was mentioning this morning, well, we are already in a distributed nature, but the assumption and the uh, aspiration is ultimately for a more coordinated distributed governance environment. And one of the first um, uh, tools that uh, might be needed in order for better coordination and also for understanding the distributed nature uh, might be uh, a tool which we have worked on, which is the um, mapping tool. And so what I'm uh, going to try to do uh, um, in the 10 minutes that I have is to briefly um, um, provide some parameters of current thinking and especially end with a call for help. Uh, meaning everyone here, um, um, except for a few, uh, are academics. And um, I would love to have a collaboration uh, uh, among uh, everyone uh, in order to establish this map that then can allow for more research to happen, but can especially allow for a better coordination and a better insight of the current environment that we have. Um, now I messed this up here. All right. Um, the need for a map, I, I won't go uh, uh, into that because Bill clearly uh, uh, masterly defined the, uh, uh, the value proposition uh, for a map uh, that is needed. Uh, we see an increased uh, distributed nature 
uh, of the internet, an increased complexity, but there is no description. I mean, we have a territory that is complex, but we don't have a map that describes the territory, uh, nor a map that can guide us in order to establish more cooperation and uh, coordination. This was acknowledged uh, at set occasions. This was acknowledged at the Net Mundial. It was also acknowledged at the uh, 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 President Eels report and was re-established uh, as a uh, necessity at the Net Mundial uh, initiative uh, launch. And so what we're trying to do is to respond uh, to this need and to create uh, a map. But as I indicated, the emphasis is on co-creating a map. I mean, this task is way too big for one organization or way too big for even uh, one sector like academics uh, uh, to undertake. And so we, we will have to co-create uh, a map. And, but the idea is to establish some kind of an infrastructure that could develop this uh, map in a meaningful way. And so the idea is to uh, create a common understanding of the current terrain around what is uh, uh, being addressed under the rubric of internet governance. How are those issues addressed right now? I, what are the current responses uh, that uh, uh, we are aware of? Who is working uh, on those uh, responses or have developed responses so that we have a better understanding of also the actors? And then where uh, are the uh, responses being developed, so the spheres? And so yesterday I was joking that an, uh, an exercise we often do at GovLab is posing the question, if only we knew dot, 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 and I think the map tries to address, if only we knew what issues are being addressed by whom and how and at what context, uh, that's the question that uh, uh, we uh, hope to start uh, answering. The use cases, again, Bill has already identified several use cases, but obviously uh, the use of a map would be great to identify needs and opportunities for further cooperation and coordination, would be great to identify and engage participants and experts. I mean, we're a big believer that experts quite often are disconnected and connecting experts might actually uh, provide for better uh, answers and to enable the creation of a distributed governance uh, network uh, or networks, as was uh, discussed. Now, how are we planning to uh, develop the map? And these are the design principles. Clearly, as Bill has said, meaning we are adopting a user-centric uh, approach. And so uh, uh, we are having a set of uh, uh, interviews with uh, potential users in order to start understanding what are the real needs. Uh, because there is no point in developing a map or a tool uh, that would not address a specific need. And so clearly, uh, what I would like to hear from you, uh, perhaps during uh, lunch uh, as well, is, is, is you are also a user group, right? Because as I said, meaning it's a data infrastructure that then can allow for a variety of other purposes to take place. One purpose might be research. Uh, so what would be the ideal uh, tool uh, or map that you would have. Uh, we also um, um, want to establish an infrastructure that where content can be co-developed and co-reviewed because the review process is going to be important of how the map is being established. And so we're developing this uh, crowdsourcing uh, um, potential uh, that around specific issues uh, uh, we can also have a specific set of uh, data being contributed, uh, and that obviously needs to be reviewed. Again, very important, and, and Bill identified in his paper also questions of where would, for instance, the concept of a clearinghouse be based. I think, again, a very important role for academics uh, is to actually uh, uh, be the uh, boat creator, but also the uh, reviewer or the provider of quality uh, of a, a particular tool. And I think that's, again, an important function that academics uh, can have. Um, we will um, uh, develop a process that is transparent, meaning we are planning uh, the coming months to, uh, um, to engage and on each decision stage have some kind of an engagement with a wider uh, audience. 
and we are also uh, collaborating with other mapping efforts because there's no point in duplication, uh, but there could be, of course, a, a variety of complementary actions. I mean, there are, this is not the only mapping exercise. There are other mapping exercises, like, for instance, the uh, um, European Commission has started uh, its own uh, mapping exercise under the uh, uh, rubric of um, GIPO, uh, which is the observatory uh, um, uh, model. And so we've had already conversations with GIPO in how to uh, coordinate, which has a, a kind of function, a different kind of functionality that they have in mind. I mean, some of the basic functionalities that we are uh, uh, working around. Um, one is uh, this relationship display, where you would uh, find uh, a clear understanding about what issue, uh, how has one issue being addressed by whom, so you would have a relationship between the issue and the responses and then the actors, and then you would have additional relationship displays as well. Very important, of course, will be uh, multiple languages, so the uh, tool that we are uh, um, um, designing, uh, co-designing right now, uh, the initial feature is to have at least all the UN languages uh, being present, uh, because the, the challenge, as um, uh, Jovan already has indicated, the challenge is quite often is that uh, um, there's already a divide based upon just the use of the language. Uh, search, zoom, and filtering seems to be an, uh, 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 a straightforward one. Also, providing supplemental content and then ultimately, as already indicated, uh, this uh, map can only succeed uh, by having some kind of a crowdsourced uh, functionality. Um, the questions that we are uh, going to address moving forward and that we will, as I said, in an, through an engagement strategy, uh, will seek to answer are, for instance, with regard, obviously, with the content, meaning this map will only be valuable if the content is valuable, and so what are uh, the issues that should be addressed? And first of all, what are the priority issues that we should address in the initial phase? Uh, because this ultimately will have to be iterative moving forward. Um, um, so what kind of issues, responses, and actors should be part of the map? With regard to the architecture, especially with regard to the information architecture, what kind of taxonomy of the issues should we use, uh, meaning Jovan already uh, provided one kind of taxonomy with regard to social issues, economic issues. Are there other taxonomies that we should use for the description and the tagging of the uh, uh, content that then can uh, allow for this relationship mapping? What methods could be used to employ accuracy, to employ also a certain level of quality? Kinds of functionalities should uh, 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 be in the initial stage be uh, developed. And then also, how can we actually engage the, uh, um, the community for co-creation um, of mechanisms? I would love, if Jovan is developing hubs uh, around the world, I would love to have, for instance, when this hub meets, to have like a uh, mapping day uh, uh, with the hub so that you would have basically a, which is a similar kind of thing which we do all the time in hackathons, uh, but you would basically have like a mapathon uh, in which you would contribute to the map uh, at moments in time where people are uh, gathering so that the map becomes ultimately beneficial for those hubs but also for a broader group. Now, one final thing I want to say is that, which is a little bit uh, this, uh, uh, a distinguishing feature of uh, what um, uh, Bill has described about, what we hope to do is to have an, an, an infrastructure, a data infrastructure, which is similar to like the open data infrastructures of um, descriptive data uh, of what issues have been addressed through what responses, through what actors. The idea is that once you have this descriptive data infrastructure, then you can have a variety of additional features such as, for instance, an analysis of who has done a better job, or a ranking of the actors, or even a context uh, analysis of what issues have not been addressed, for instance, the orphan issues. But that should not be the main function of this development of the tool. I think once the tool is there, then you can have an ecosystem, talking about other ecosystems, an ecosystem of analysis through a variety of uh, um, uh, actors, including, I hope, 
uh, actors that are present in this uh, audience um, that would further their thinking and also would further their work uh, once they have a data infrastructure that is currently absent or incomplete uh, or hard to, uh, uh, to find. So um, I would love to get um, answers to some of those questions and I hope that we can uh, engage in the further development of this uh, tool moving forward. There, is, uh, uh, there are some uh, email addresses there, uh, but I would be delighted. Uh, uh, give me your business card or send me your email uh, to further engage you. We are going to develop a, uh, a listserv of all those who have expressed already an interest uh, to anyway engage you moving forward uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, applause. <laughs> Now, if we might get Constance back uh, onto the screen for the discussion round, that would be wonderful. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that happens, but yes, Giuseppe is helping us. Um, sorry? Yeah, it's my magic. Exactly, it's magic. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much for this, uh, for this very comprehensive overview of different tools um, and platforms that are currently being developed or already have been initiated, uh, be it within the IGF or uh, the tool that you are working on, which is obviously very exciting. Um, now, I'd li immediately like to open the floor and perhaps um, ask exactly Marilia um, to pose a question. And if there is a microphone, sorry, Giuseppe, you have to run. <laughs> um, to give her a microphone so she can pose her question. Thank you very much. This is Marília from the Center for Technology and Society of FGV in Brazil. Thank you very much for this fascinating panel. I have two questions maybe for Stefan or for Jovan, whoever wants to respond. Uh, maybe the first one is more related uh, to what Stefan has presented. In your mapping, are you going to focus on where the issues are discussed in terms of making an analysis of the mandates of institutions, then you would have a more static view? Or would you try to capture where the issues are moving towards? Because I think that this is the more interesting process. There are a lot of dynamics of attempts of forward shifting, for instance. Um, security is a topic that is under the ITU, but some countries are trying to push some things there and to, to, to really understand what the debate is about. Maybe it's interesting to capture not only the static view of the ecosystem, but the dynamics. But what would be the tools to capture this evolving ecosystem or evolving dynamics? My second question is, okay, we do a mapping and we understand the field, the field, but how we make sure that people actually have the tools to participate, how we accelerate the learning curve of people. Because to map that privacy issues, for instance, are now discussed in ICANN is one thing. The issues are deeply technical and complex. And I think that that's a second barrier for many actors with less resources. It's not only to understand what they are, but how to accelerate this, this learning curve for them to actually be meaningful while things are still being discussed because we are looking at a, 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 an environment that develops really fast. And my last question is, I have seen in our case studies and in your presentations, little reference to cross-sphere synchronization, synchronization of the different levels, national, regional, international policy development. How this mapping exercise could help us understand what is going on on the national level? Because some countries that are drivers of internet governance or are governments that have more power to influence the trends, if we don't capture in advance what are the trends that are being emerged nationally, then we lose the pace to intervene globally. So how could we synchronize these different spheres of governance? Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay, three great questions and, and, and already indicates the complexity of uh, uh, developing the map and also the demand out there for some kind of a map. Uh, uh, my answer will be more humble in the sense of that I think these would be um, great outcomes of the map, uh, but the map in an initial phase uh, uh, is not going to do that kind of analytical work with regard to your first question. Uh, because that is already an analytical kind of assessment uh, of a hey, where is the uh, where are the issues uh, being addressed, meaning, and where is it moving forward, and is it within the mandate of a set of actors that are uh, supposed to be uh, um, acting on those kind of issues? 
what the initial phase of the map is going to be is just issues. These are the set of responses that are currently uh, uh, either have been developed or are being developed. And these are the actors that have developed those responses or are claiming to work on some of those issues. That is a, anyway, the, the bare minimum uh, uh, from my uh, uh, understanding that is still missing. Uh, once you have that, as I said, then it would be great uh, to have your organization in, uh, 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 in Rio de Janeiro to do the additional analytics. Uh, for instance, saying that, okay, we have the data set here, let's see what we can now from the data set, what we can extract, what meaning we can extract, for instance, with regard to uh, we see an explosion of, of uh, uh, actors in the cybersecurity space working. And we see a, uh, a clear uh, competition between those who have different mandates to start working on particular issues. We see forum shifting and so on. So all those in analytical kind of extractions are great extractions, but I think at the current stage in my head, I try to separate those kind of extractions as possible uses of an infrastructure that you first need to build. And so, uh, and so, and again, the idea is that once, once we are in an early stage, if, if for instance, once we come out with a uh, an initial prototype, uh, if we ever get there, um, then, it would be, for instance, great to have you test it and say, well, look, based upon this prototype, I can make those kinds of analytical uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, if it's not feasible, then we have to rebuild it, right, or tweak it here and there. And so, so it's going to be iterative, uh, um, humble initially, uh, um, uh, which is already a huge task, uh, in order to then provide the best possible value. Now, on the second, uh, and again, any suggestions, welcome. On the second uh, question, um, I mean, what, what we would like, I mean, GovLab would like to build as additional feature, once we have the feature, is this expert networking feature, by which you then basically would be able to have, uh, um, and which we are building already somewhat, uh, which you would basically see around what issue, who are the experts that have worked on some of those issues, and then provide a functionality that would allow you to connect some of those uh, experts with those who might have a particular demands. And so that would address then, because I'm a big uh, believer of not only finding information by search, but finding information by talking to the experts, uh, that would then address the capacity quite often challenge that we have right now. Because at the moment there is no, ma no matching platform, except for the Geneva <laughs> platform perhaps, but no matching platform between the demand, i.e., I want to learn more about X, and then the expertise that is out there that is somehow quite often untapped at the moment. And so documenting that expertise through the map, and then an additional stage, connecting a platform that matches demand with the expertise, in addition to, of course, becoming smarter using the map, uh, is what uh, uh, we also want to build, and which is needed. And then on the third, um, well, the idea is to also clearly, anyway, not only do the global uh, assessment, but also have national maps. And so that's the, that's the other uh, uh, element that we want to build that then would allow for, again, meaning from a research point of view, you could then do comparative research. Uh, you could focus in on how different countries are, are doing it and that kind of stuff. And you could do modeling, meaning what models are. Would, anyway, look, there are... Thousands of research questions from my point of view that are currently unaddressed because of the lack of some kind of a data infrastructure. And so that's where I want to go to, yeah. Thank you very much. There was another question there, yes. and then Marco Rico. Yeah. Um, just, just a few, few quick comments. Uh, I'm involved in the mapping exercise for the Commission on Science and Technology and Development, which will be presented at next interministerial meeting at the end of November with the five members of a peer expert group. And uh, it proved the old saying for, I think, Moltke, that even the best military plan cannot survive engagement with the enemy. We started with a great plan, academic plan, and then when you start applying it to cybersecurity, different issues, Simply, you need to cut, like procrastium bed, you need to cut whatever is missing. Therefore, it is delicate exercise to have the overall scheme. Uh, now, what is, uh, just a f one point on the Marilia's question. 
these policy elevators, somebody, we started with metaphors, aquarium was uh, this morning, are extremely important because of the so-called policy laundering. Many policy issues are getting back to the national scene through regional and global. It was introduced with a clipper chip 10 years ago by the US and Vassenara agreement, but it has been used quite a lot into the IG processes, uh, these this elevators. Practical question, in the preparation for Geneva Internet Conference, we are running three discussion online processes with remote hubs all over the world. And uh, Stefan, it's a great idea. Oh, the next discussion will start on the 6th of October with the question, what is the phone number, paraphrasing famous Kissinger statement, that you should call if you have IG problem? Therefore, we'll have people all over the world trying to identify what are the phone numbers that they should call on national, regional, global level. Why we are choosing this approach? Because legitimacy of IG process is at stake if we just keep it as abstract. Diplomats in Geneva, users, business communities, parliamentarians need concrete questions. Yes, it is a complex, it is a complicated field, but if we don't try to make uh, concrete answers to the concrete, tangible questions, we may lose the legitimacy of the overall process. And I see this as a make or break point of the overall uh, internet governance, whatever you call it, ecosystem or policy process. Thank you very much. Yes. Lorenzo Pupillo from Telecom Italia. Um, I think it's uh, extremely important to think about the concept of uh, uh, clearing house, but so far, the concept, the idea that you have presented uh, seems to be uh, geared towards uh, uh, the idea of uh, clearing house as a tool for capacity building for internet governance. In other words, the uh, idea of uh, engaging more people, um, breaking the silos, making available more content on internet governance. Uh, to some extent, it's something comparable, as has been said, to what uh, the Commission, the European Commission, is doing with the, or want to do with the JIPO project. Okay. My question is, can the concept of clearing house become instead a tool of internet governance? And what, what uh, I mean exactly this uh, concept. Um, we all agree, as also Fadi say in uh, Istanbul, that uh, 2014, unless something dramatic happens at, uh, in, uh, in Busan, but uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is the winner of this year, you know, in other words, comparing to the WISIS, to the multilateral approach of the past. Uh, but even in the, the net mundial, there was the awareness that there is a, a dynamic between the different stakeholders and there is a dynamic between the idea of uh, how we put together the equal footing approach with the the role that each stakeholder want to play, okay? So, my question is, my idea, we have, uh, we as a Telecom Italia have, uh, did a workshop presented also for Net Mundial, this concept of, uh, uh, of um, multi-stakeholder approach with variable geometry. In other words, the idea is, uh, can we uh, design, like, uh, or, or envisage a role for a clearing house to help the better mapping between governance issues and government institutions they should try to approach. In other words, uh, uh, I envisage a process in which there is a, a first stage in which all the players on equal footing debate the issues, but then some of them, with the agreement of everybody, should take the lead on some issues, like cybersecurity, maybe the government, standardization of the private sector, right, human rights, the civil society. Okay, if this process is not clear, the clearing house can help in that to say, listen, I think that uh, the best institution to approach this approach is, uh, is A, B, and C. Did you get my point, Bill? Sort of. Um, what, what I was suggesting was not something that would be part of a negotiation mechanism um, or be, be designed specifically to facilitate the formation of negotiation positions, the resolution of all outstanding issues, or so on. 
Um, there are many different needs in the IG ecosystem, depending on how you visualize that, um, that are not being met fully, and the kinds of things you have to do to address different problems may involve different solutions. What I'm talking about is something that is a bit more bounded uh, in the sense of simply trying to enhance the availability, accessibility, and usability of knowledge and information, and to provide, particularly for non-dominant actors, um, a bit, some assistance uh, uh, with analysis and developing uh, relationships, relationship management. To the extent that those kinds of things could feed into the resolution of some of the larger geopolitical issues as they play out in existing institutions or so on, fine. But that was not the, the fundamental concept that, that, we, were, that I, we had here. Um, if, you, if you look at the language that was included in the Net Mondial uh, document uh, or uh, some of the other kinds of places where these ideas have been put forward, I think there's been in a way uh, a certain desire to insulate them from being bound up in hot geopolitics uh, in a way that would lead to them being sunk for reasons that are separate from what's actually being proposed. Um, and so I tend to take that view myself. I, I, I think that you know if we, if we leap into this in a way that suggests that the purpose of a, uh, such an initiative would be to directly impact uh, negotiation processes, bargaining dynamics, things like that. You are definitely going to get a lot of pushback from a lot of different players, and pretty soon the whole thing gets weighed down with all the weight of all the disputes <laughs> that exist in a variety of other environments, and you go nowhere. Um, so I, I was really kind of arguing for something that would be a little bit more separate from that kind of thing. But that does not to say that, you know, as I said, I mean, in the example I gave of Wicket, um, you know, I, I, I heard repeatedly, for example, from people involved in certain regions, I guess I probably should be more specific, that they were um, getting only information from uh, the ITU about what the other players were doing and so there, when, you were in, when we were in Dubai, it was quite clear that there was a complete lack of understanding of what some of the actors were doing. On the other hand, some of the people who were taking the opposite view, I think also were only getting one side of the story from the information sources they had, and that they were not being fully exposed to the thinking on the other side. And so to the extent that sharing information in a more open, accessible, formatted, and balanced way allows actors involved in these processes to assess their own stances and the stances of their counterparts on a more effective basis, you know, that's great. But I, I, I wouldn't want to have it set up as solely being about that. Thank you very much. There was another question by Fabro Steibel from the Institute for Technology and Society in Rio. Hi, my question is to Helvan. Uh, you mentioned that uh, NetMundial is more and more uh, framing a positive way in several uh, events and several uh, circles of influence. And my question would be, uh, have you noticed any um, event or system that is being framed in a bad way? If NetMundial is going up, have you recognized anyone that's going down or it's perceived as a bad experience? Um, Constance, would you maybe like to respond? Or is this question directed at anyone in particular? Uh, it would be to Hoven, from, uh, but it can be to Constance as well. Okay. Constance, can you hear us? Did Jovan want to start and then I should follow, or do you want Perfect. me to jump in? Yes, and I would ask you actually to be brief because we are running out of time. I apologize for that, but Jovan, go first. Uh, uh, 
Well, just, a, just a quick comment. I think this question is excellent. And uh, Marilia brought in, in discussion that Net Mundial introduced quite a few innovations. But let us be realistic. Net Mundial is a part of highly politicized space. Therefore, it carries a symbolism. And uh, what is essentially and important is to deconstruct the general narratives and to avoid binary logic, Net Mundial versus, versus whatever on the other side, and to look into the concrete uh, mechanisms that can strengthen inclusive uh, internet governance processes. This is the crucial. Can we negotiate uh, in multi-stakeholder environment? As Marilia said, I use, like to use a metaphor from bl blue skies to red lines. We started with the blue sky, everything is possible, but in the last minute there were many, many red lines. Therefore, it is reality. And I think the only way to save this robustness and to improve robustness is to start from reality to avoid using the, the I'm sorry, the, the, the general vague language and concepts because people do not relate anymore to that. And uh, this is also the spirit of our conference in November. We want to deconstruct and see what does it mean in concretely, in practice, all of these concepts which were introduced at Net Mundial, but also at the ITU uh, meeting uh, versus, versus uh, Plus 10 in uh, June, which was which was multi-stakeholder with the different connotations, but introduced also some, uh, some interesting processes. But this is the key, to deconstruct the, this ideological dilemma and look into the concrete issues and rebuild IG space around really solid grounding and buy-in from the majority of actors. Constance, please. Yes, and I, I promise to, to be brief. Uh, so to address directly the, the question, um, following Net Mundial has um, other organizations or, or fora, uh, have they been impacted? Um, there is a very clear call in the Net Mundial declaration and commitment from the international community to strengthen the IGF. Um, and I would like to link this question to um, what we heard from several of the panelists in terms of met methodology, which I think is perfectly uh, correct. You need to start by mapping the issues before you go to trying to link issues to solutions. Um, now, from my perspective, uh, with the work of the CSTD, with the work of the European Commission, uh, with the work of a lot of academics who participate to the IGF, from my perspective, the mapping has already been done. Um, and what maps usually show is that you need global coordination. You need a single place where people can find the information, where they can find experts, lead experts, where they can find um, background information, where they can find uh, preliminary outcomes of negotiations, of informal work between uh, stakeholders, of academic networks. Um, and this, I think, uh, really calls uh, for a time of action. I think the mapping uh, over the 10 past years uh, since uh, the WIS has started, I think the international community has really made this, the, has completed this job already. And now I think uh, the expectation is to find light, informal, and inclusive mechanisms, multi-stakeholder mechanisms, where we, act, we can actually connect those issues to solutions. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the best practices. Um, the IGF offers huge potential. There are, outside of the IGF, other mechanisms. Um, and from my perspective, and it's very interesting time in history, we are at a testing point whether or not multi-stakeholder mechanisms will be able to demonstrate they can produce tangible outcomes. Um, so I believe, again, that the mapping exercise has more or less been done uh, by governments, IGOs, or academics, and now the community, including academics, because academics are good for thinking, but they're actually good to help in implementation as well. And all this community has to come together and, and put the work in motion to start concretely tackling difficult issues and work on outcomes, shared outcomes.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this was an excellent closing statement, very strong one. And um, I would now like to conclude basically by just um, framing the day of this morning. We started um, with basically top-down uh, design questions and then shared some bottom-up experiences that were informed of some of the case studies that we produced within the network of centers. Um, now, this session dealt with concrete tools and uh, practices that are being tried um, in order to uh, inform and uh, promote the, the, the evolution of uh, this distributed and collaborative internet governance ecosystem. This afternoon, um, now this all, we try to do this all with a special regard to the role of academia in these, um, in these issues. And this afternoon, we will try to tie everything back up together um, in the afternoon session. So please stick with us. Uh, we have lunch now, I've been asked for, to, um, to make, um, uh, basically tell you where lunch is, it's downstairs. Uh, we will reconvene here at three o'clock. And uh, I would now like to take the opportunity to thank all panelists and you for, for participating in this session. Thank you very much.